Continuing on with the TNCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Roger Drumboski. Today's presentation is titled Stories and How I Research Them. Roger will highlight how he classifies stories, fact or fiction, using the story of Plymouth Colony on his 400th anniversary of the Pilgrim's Landing. It illustrates the importance of using primary sources to get at the truth in genealogy research. He will then share family stories from several generations with information on how he researched them. These stories will include examples from his parents and from three lines of ancestry going back to colonial America. A particularly interesting story is about his Mayflower ancestor, 10th great grandfather Stephen Hopkins. This will be a fun as well as educational presentation. It will provide many ideas on how to research your family stories, getting at truth and meaning, and Roger is also a member of the Donna Anna County Genealogical Society, the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, New Mexico chapter, and is approved for membership in the Society of Sons of the American Revolution, Gladstone chapter, and, uh, and New Mexico SAR. So without further ado, I would like to extend a warm virtual welcome to Roger Drombowski. Thank you, Suzanne, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the stories of our ancestors contribute to the personal narratives of our lives and their collective stories contribute to the narratives of our culture. So stories have meaning. These stories can be based on varying degrees of veracity. The tools of genealogy, genealogy research can be used to place the stories we encounter on this spectrum. This is illustrated by use of the Mayflower story on this 400th anniversary of her landing in Plymouth. Primary sources are the gold standard for genealogical research material. These are sources created contemporaneously by those who were directly involved in the events. The history of Plymouth Plantation is documented by primary sources such as Colony Records and William Bradford's On Plymouth Plantation, so its historical foundation is solid. Not so some of the details, however. I became interested in genealogy when I was introduced to Family Search several years ago. The information in my Family Search record showed that I had seven lines of ancestry to Mayflower Associates, and that's what really got me interested in researching my ancestors. Using primary sources, I've been able to validate four of these lines and was approved to become a member of the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. Three of these lines of ancestry, however, proved to be false. In the mistaken category, there were two Isaac Fosters in Massachusetts in the 1730s. One was a Mayflower descendant and not my ancestor. Using find a grave, I was able to determine that the Mayflower descendant was buried in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and my ancestor was buried in Bradford, Pennsylvania. In the made-up category, I was shown as descended from William Bradford's daughter, Sarah. But it turns out that William Bradford had no such daughter, Sarah, so that was false. They also showed me as being descended from, from the Wampanoag Massasoit through a great-grandmother or great-grandparents who had no children, so that was also false. In the myth category is Plymouth Rock. The pilgrims certainly waded through the surf. In any case, they first landed at Provincetown, not at Plymouth. In the folklore category, I would put the capital P pilgrims. They were called brownists or first comers and called themselves saints and strangers or adventurers, depending on whether they were separatists or merchants. In the legend category, I would place the Mayflower. Something's fishy about the Mayflower. The primary sources refer to her as the big ship. Other ships sailing to Plymouth uh, were named. For instance, the Anne, the Fortune, the Charity, and the Little James are named as landing at Plymouth in years shortly after 1620. There are no records of the Mayflower from 1616 when she was trading English textiles for French wine and in, eight, in 1624, when she was in the shipyard, 
being inventoried to settle the estate of Christopher Jones, who was the master of the big chip. Records for the for 16, 20, and 21 may be, may be lost or missing, or there may be no records. Maybe the Mayflower brought the pilgrims to Plymouth, and maybe she was in the shipyard. All of these stories have meaning. In, in the case of the Thanksgiving story, 400 years after this event of the, of the Thanksgiving feast in 1621 of the pilgrims, we still celebrate uh, Thanksgiving in our country, and it has meaning for us. The story has become part of our culture, along with Winthrop's on Christian Charity, which has City on the Hill, and helps found the idea of American exceptionalism and its corollary manifest destiny. We celebrate our thankfulness for what we have and for who we are. The meaning for indigenous American brothers and sisters, however, is quite different. It is not as folklore ha would have it. The painting shows the pilgrims and the Indian villagers sharing a Thanksgiving feast, but the festival may have been more like a European Oktoberfest or St. Martin's Mass, which are celebrated prior to the fasting season of Advent, similar to Carnival and Mardi Gras, in, in our hemisphere before the season of Lent. In any case, they were celebrating and firing off their matchlocks and their cannons, making such a racket that they had attracted the attention of the nearby Wampanoag Indians. And the Wampanoag Indians sent 90 warriors, armed warriors, to defend the pilgrims. And that's how the Indians got to the feast. They were not because they were invited, but because they came to defend the, the pilgrims who they thought were being attacked. There were 90 armed uh, Indian warriors and about 50 or 51 pilgrims, so they were way outnumbered by the, by the Wampanoags. The Wampanoags were, were uh, basically fulfilling a clause of a treaty that they had negotiated with with the pilgrims in, in about end of March or early April in 1621. And one of the clauses of that treaty was that if any of them would unjustly war against him, he, he would aid him. And if any did war against us, he should aid us. So the pilgrims, so the Wampanoag were not only hospitable to the pilgrims, but they were actually militarily allied with them. Things didn't, things didn't remain so friendly, so friendly, however, and later on the, uh, the Europeans started abusing the hospitality that the natives had uh, shown to them. So the meaning for, for our indigenous American brothers and sisters is, is not the same as the meaning that we have for Thanksgiving. And on Thanksgiving Day, the, the Native Americans celebrate a national day of mourning commemorate the loss of their sovereignty to, to, uh, to the settler, European settlers. This is, this is a monument that discusses what the National Day of Mourning means to the Native American people. In uh, 1675, uh, the son of the Wampanoag uh, Massasoit that, that greeted and treated with the Pilgrims organized a revolt against the settlers, and he tried to throw the English back into the sea. At that time, uh, of course, the English settlers had multiplied from the 50 that were present at Thanksgiving to, to thousands, and, and King Philip lost his little war. As a result, he was, he was killed and beheaded, and his body was mutilated. And the Wampanoag and, and Native American women and children were sold into slavery into the Caribbean. So this illustrates that, that stories 400 years after the fact can have different meanings for different groups of people. I think it's good that we acknowledge uh, some of these darker sides of our stories so that we can understand the limitations of our own narratives.
The Wampanoags are still fighting for their sovereignty in Massachusetts. Are there any comments? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. Um, you mentioned that in the beginning of your presentation that you had were able to prove four of seven lines. Um, I know that you know sometimes that there's misinformation out there on all the different websites like Family Search and Ancestry, depending on how good the person who researched the trees are as far as uh, their ability to, to uh, especially use primary resources. Um, but with the three lines that you said that you could not prove or, or were proven wrong, um, did you correct those in Family Search, or um, you know, so other misinformation doesn't continue to be uh, allowed to be used? That's that's still on my to-do list. I ha I haven't done that, but I do need to do that, and it's on my list of things to do when I get around to it. <laughs> and I should do that. Yeah, because I, I always encourage all the students to, you know, to always make sure that if they find misinformation to try to correct it as best they can. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, you, sound, you sound like you've been researching the Mayflower for a lot of years. How, how many years have you been doing this? Well, I discovered uh, a family search in Casper, Wyoming on a, on a summer road trip uh, three years ago. So that's when I first found out that I had uh, made flower ancestors or, or the possibility, and that's when I started researching it. Uh, I, I guess I, my first, uh, I, I first proved my ancestry from William Bradford, and I completed that about a, a year and a half ago, and my ancestry to uh, Stephen Hopkins and Edward Fuller had, was just approved about two months ago. So it's taken some time to research those lines and to document them to the satisfaction of the Mayflower Society. Wonderful. Now you mentioned uh, the value of primary documents. Um, what would you cite for the class as, as um, the types of primary documents that you had to find and, and uh, use as proof? Well, primarily birth, marriage, and death records, but of course they don't exist for for older older events prior to about 1900. So other sources needed to be used. Uh, I use things like handwritten genealogies from one of my great grand stepmothers. Uh, uh, I, used, uh, I used books about uh, descents and lineage that, that uh, were, were pretty well recognized. And pl plus, the, there's other, there's associated lines uh, that uh, with the Mayflower Society that can be used. For instance, one of my great great uncles, uh, Charles Allen, uh, had been approved for the Mayflower Society many decades ago, and I could use his uh, research lineage uh, back to back to his Mayflower ancestor to verify mine. So those are some examples. Wonderful. Now, I'm sure, do you, do you use the silver books as well? Use what? Did you use the silver books as well? Yes. Yes, the Mayflower Society documents uh, several generations. Uh, I think the silver books go at least five generations uh, subsequent to uh, the Mayflower generation. and. And the Mayflower Society accepts that lineage, so that if you can link to that, to that lineage, then then they'll approve the rest of it. Wonderful, thank you. And that appears to be all the questions for now. Well, it looks like I really know how to spell question, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, to illustrate the value of primary sources, I want to go to the story about my father, Joseph Dombrowski. He was born in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1916 and died in Pennsylvania in 1992. Uh, of course, uh, the narrative, my own personal narrative of my life and, and uh, certainly my father's and mother's lives uh, uh, is, is very important to me. And, and uh, I want to illustrate that I learned some things by looking at some primary sources about my father. 
My father grew up on a farm in western Pennsylvania. Uh, he was one of six siblings. There were four boys and two girls. And, and uh, during the Depression, uh, the two oldest boys, my, my father Joe and his uncle, my uncle's family, uh, were sent away to the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, the, the program of the CCC was for Depression boys to go work uh, on conservation projects and their pay would be sent home to their families. They would keep $25, but their main part of their pay would go home to their families and support their family during the Depression. My father told me about his, his Civilian Conservation Corps uh, experiences. He, he told me that he learned his trade. He was a land surveyor. He learned his trade in the Civilian Conservation Corps. And uh, I, and me coming from the West, I assumed that, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of history of the CCC in the West because I live here. Uh, I like to travel. I like to camp. And lots of places that I go have CCC projects and CCC history. And so I kind of assumed that my father and, and, uh, and his brother came out West with the CCC. They both married Western girls. My father married a coal miner's daughter from Colorado, and my uncle Stanley married a rancher's uh, daughter from Kingman, Arizona. So, I, in my my own narrative of my history, I was thinking that possibly my father and my uncle met their wives while they were in the West of the Civilian Conservation Corps. My father also served in the Army in World War II. He served in North Africa and Italy. And this is a picture of my father. Uh, uh, can you see my mouse? My father's right there in the center of the picture under the pyramid. Uh, so that's, that's primary documentation that he was in the army in Egypt. And from the history of the CCC, the narrative that I had was, was part of the history of the CCC, which is that the discipline core of CCC boys uh, formed the foundation of the, of the first uh, wave of the army or the disciplined corps that was allowed to go into North Africa and begin World War II in North Africa. So my personal narrative was I thought my father was part of that story. He may have gone from the CCC into the army and fought in North Africa and, and then went on to fight in Italy. I was a few years ago, actually about a year ago, I got curious about which camp my father served in. So I decided I'd go find out. And so I went to the National Archive and they have, they have a way where you can request uh, CCC personnel records for members of your family that, that served in the CCC. So I did that. I filled out the form and requested the information and was able to obtain uh, my father's Civilian Conservation Corps personnel record, which is a primary document. It was created at the time by, by, by himself and others that were directly involved with the service in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, I got a bonus. Uh, they also sent me a civil service record. And my father was a civil service uh, land surveyor, so that record was quite extensive and covered many you know, his decades of service in the, in the civil service. So that was a bonus that they just sent me for free, which was pretty nice. And these are, this is a timeline that I created from, from those documents, the CCC personnel file and the civil service personnel file. Shows that we were born in Erie, Pennsylvania, and that uh, in uh, February of uh, 1916, and that corresponds with the birth certificate that I had to supply for the for the Mayflower Society. So that's consistent with the other primary record that I have. The next entry is kind of interesting. Uh, I found two entries on some of his applications. One showed him graduating from Academy High School in Erie, Pennsylvania. And another one showed that he was an eight-year graduate of grammar school and had one year of high school in Mobile, Pennsylvania. 
So there's a little bit of a conflict there, and it showed that even primary sources sometimes can have inconsistent information. And so you have to analyze uh, sometimes to, to provide weight to see, see what, uh, what's what. And my father always told me that he graduated from eighth grade. He never told me that he graduated from high school. And this high school was about 26 miles from the farm where Lowville, uh, Pennsylvania is about one mile from the farm. So I think it's probably more tr probable that the graduation from Academy High School is misinformation. Next comes the CCC, and it was very interesting to me that my father didn't serve in the CCC in the West. He served in the CCC in Pennsylvania in the State Forestry Department. So my as my my narrative and assumption that that, uh, that he served in the West was wrong. And obviously he couldn't have met my mother because this shows him serving in the Civilian Conservation Corps from, from uh, 1934 until 1936 in Pennsylvania. It does confirm that, that he was an instrument man, so it's likely that, that he did learn his serving profession while he was there. We got out of the CCC in, in 1936, which is well before the beginning of World War II. So my thought about him going from the CCC to the Army is obviously wrong, because he didn't join the Army until uh, 1942. Uh, uh, he, he joined the Army and, and went to basically training at Fort Leonard Wood and became when it, through combat engineering training, so he's a combat engineer. And then the next interesting uh, thing in this record is that is the part of his training was auto mechanic school in Grand Junction, Colorado in 1943. In 1943, my mother was attending Mesa College in Grand Junction, Colorado. So. Now I think I have a little bit better idea about how he met my mother than, than I did before I got these documents. So that, that uh, showed the value of, of pursuing some, some of these primary documents, even for stories that we think we know pretty well. I thought that was a beautiful illustration of the value of a timeline uh, by taking your, your documents that you received from the uh, National Archives and putting it into the timeline. I thought it was brilliant. Um, and I would really like to encourage the students uh, to really think very seriously about timelines. Um, how, how do you handle timelines on a, you know, on a general way of, of uh, approaching it? I mean, do you just sit down and put all your documents in front of you and uh, arrange them chronologically and then enter them in on an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document. You know, what is your method for uh, building a timeline? Well, this, in th this case, I, you know, the, the records that I got were chronological, so it was relatively easy to create the timeline. Of course, I had two records, a CCC record and a civilian civil service record, they were, they didn't overlap, so I could just go through the records and then lay out the timeline from the records. Uh, I guess enough, I did that on a, on a, on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it could also be done, you know, if you've got records that aren't sequential, uh, you could, uh, you, you could just keep a, a a chronology and just update it as you find more and more information and other documentation or other sources. It was pretty easy in the case of, of, of these records because they were chronicle, chronologically or, uh, organized. Wonderful. Yeah, timelines are so important and we've talked a lot about that in my class. Um, now, uh, do you remember about how long after you sent in your form did it take to get the information back from the National Archives? I think, uh, I don't remember exactly, but it was probably about a month. It didn't take very long. You have to send in an application and you have to prove that you're related. I had to send in copies of my passport and my birth certificate that showed that Joseph Dombrowski was my father. 
and and then they came back and told me what records they had and, and there was a fee a copying fee for the the ccc personnel file and then they 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 let me know that they had the civil service record also and they actually provided that one for free i think the civil service record was three or four pages or i mean the ccc record was three or four pages and the and the civil service record was a was you know, quite a stack of documents, but they didn't charge me for that. Wonderful. What a, what a gold mine. He must have been so excited. I was. <laughs> and I found out a lot of things about, you know, during during a lot of the, his civil service uh, uh, service, you know, I was alive and I was kind of aware of what my father was doing. So, but I found some, some interesting facts in that civil service record that I didn't know about too. So, so even parts of my life where I'm part of the story, I found additional information that was useful. Wonderful. Okay, well, that, that's all the questions that I have in the chat box so far. So I'll go ahead and turn off my microphone. Thank you. Next, I want to I wanna look uh, back further in my family history. And this is what I found on Family Search. Uh, this, is, this is the... Uh, a fan chart that was available uh, uh, in the family search, an illustration of your family tree in a fan form. And in the, in the uh, fan option, there are, there are several different ways you can display the information. This one, this one shows my ancestors on the, on the left side are my, are my Polish grandparents, and I don't know very much about them. I, know that they came to the United States, immigrated from Poland in about 1911, and they were married in Chicago and, and uh, bought a farm in Pennsylvania and raised my father and his, his siblings. So, and, and I need to start researching that branch of my family. On the maternal side of my family, uh, she's uh, descended from a long, pretty long line of, of Mormon ancestors and family family search had a lot of information on, on her ancestors and is displayed here in this fan chart uh, starting up here with my grand my maternal grandfather's uh line his 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 uh ancestors his, his uh, grandfather came from england and his his uh his Grandmother and maternal grandfather and grandmother have long lines of ancestry back into colonial uh, British America. On the maternal side of, of uh, my mother's line are Mormon ancestors that came from Denmark and England. And so this showed the origin of these ancestors in this fan chart. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the on the those uh, lines of ancestry. So three lines of ancestry from my second great grandparents on back into into the colonial era. Uh, I'll touch just a little bit on the uh, on the uh, Mormon migration side, particularly on my my maternal uh, grandparent side. Uh, the Mormons uh, migrated. Uh, uh, well, let me go back. On, on the per my mother's paternal side, uh, most of the Mormon ancestors migrated on the Mormon Trail. And so I got a lot of information on them from this uh, Pioneer database that is a database of the, of the participants in the Mormon Trail from about 1847 to about 1856 or so. And there's the website for that Pioneer database if you have ancestors that were on the on the Mormon Trail. My on my maternal uh, great grandparent side, most of them came over by sea in the in the 1880s. And uh, the Saints by Sea is a database uh, for ancestors, Mormon ancestors that left Europe and came by sea uh, to the United States, mostly in, the, in from the, about the 1850s on, although Shem Purnell 
uh, I found his record in here, and he came by sea in 1844 from England. So I found all of these Mormon ancestors in these two databases. So these two databases were very valuable for finding information about my Mormon ancestors. Another option for the for the fan is to is to show stories. Uh, you can post stories on on the on the link to an ancestor, and this fan shows stories that have been posted for ancestors. Uh, it shows how many stories have been posted, and you you can click on on that ancestor and go to these stories and find stories that have been researched by other people that are already in the record. So that's a very interesting source for stories. Also, there's a there's another option that you can show sources and you can show photographs. Were there any questions or comments on the fan? You know, or I've on, been or on the Mormon databases. I've been using Family Search for years now, but I was not aware until today when you showed this about all the different options you have in the uh, chart um, ability to make a chart. I mean, like, you know, country of origin, you know, how many stories. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, I'm sure that there's probably many people in the class today that didn't realize that as well. Um, now, you did mention the Pioneer Database and Saints by Sea. Um, do you have to be a member of LDS, or can anyone access those databases? Anyone can access those databases. And are they free? Yes. And, and I found all of my Mormon ancestors on those two databases. Wonderful. So they seem to be pretty comprehensive. And, and they're not they're not only records of the voyages, but they're records of, of the uh, of the uh, missionaries that brought them or font sponsored them and there's there's in some cases there are journal journal entries and uh, comment entries uh, communication between the, the missionary and the, and the church back home so there's a lot of information in those uh, in those uh, databases and I found them pretty fascinating I may do a presentation later on about my Mormon ancestors, and I'll use that information to put together presentations. I'm always excited when the class can learn about new new access to databases, especially when they're free. So thank you very much. Okay, and that wanna, was, go ahead. I'm sorry. Next, I want to I want to go uh, follow some of the uh, stories of those. Uh, ancestors on my maternal grandfather's side that go back to colonial America. And I had uh, three second great grandparents that, that had ancestry that went back into colonial America. It was the, the Driggs family, the Allen family, and the Foster family. And I was able to, I was able to find family histories, in this case for the Driggs family, it was the, the, I guess the most paternal of those of that group. Uh, I was able to find the Driggs family history on archive.org, which is a free, free database that's uh, similar to Google Books or uh, uh, the Gutenberg Library that, that lets you let you find uh, publications that are that are out of uh, print. So I was able to find the Driggs family history, and that documents the Driggs family from the time they came to to the Americas until until further on in the descent to where I can make a positive connection to the family. So so this shows the Driggs family connection from from Josias uh, Durant, who's my eighth great grandfather, and he arrived in New Amsterdam on the WEC in uh, 1660. He descended, he's a descendant of Jan Durant, and he was a Baron de Rix. It's thought that the name Driggs derived from the title Driggs. Uh, Driggs is a name that's not found in Europe, so it's, it's thought that, that they changed their name uh, when they became when they were, became part of the English uh, colony of Connecticut, which is where they lived 
after after they left New Amsterdam. Uh, I guess uh, many many times uh, immigrants did change their names, and it's usually interesting to see how that came about. In this case, you can do, you can see from the family history that that it, it started uh, with. Uh, with the rant, and then through two or three other iterations, and finally it ended up with being uh, named Driggs. In the Driggs family, uh, my fifth great grandfather, Daniel Driggs, he served in this Driggs family history says that he served in a Connecticut rebel regiment in the Revolutionary War. Uh, of course, uh, this kind of a document is not a primary source, and so it's not uh, accepted for uh, genealogy societies or lineage societies like the Sons of the American Revolution. So they would not accept this uh, to document the fact that my fifth great grandfather, Daniel Driggs, was a Revolutionary War soldier. I was able to use uh, uh, primary documentation, uh, birth certificates, marriage certificates, uh, records from, this is from the daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the American Revolution to establish that Daniel Briggs was in fact uh, my fifth great grandfather and I was approved to become a member of the Sons of the American Revolution as a result of that effort. And, I, and that's also a very recent activity. Uh, I was approved to be uh, a member of the Society in, or the Sons of the American Revolution, Revolution about two months ago. And because of the COVID, uh, situation i still don't have my paperwork uh, i have to go to a meeting to do that and then they haven't been meeting during the, during this pandemic uh, crisis so that's the difference between a, a non-primary and a primary source and how they can be used also on archive.org when i searched for Driggs, i found uh, this uh, work of fiction and it's uh it was written by one of my great uh, uncles. It's inspired by life in the late 1890s on a ranch on the western slope of the Rocky Mountains. It's a tale of cowboys, Indians, mountain men, bandits, and Mormon girls. Pretty exciting little book. And what's interesting about it is it's dedicated to my second great grandmother who loved the wild roses. So I presume that's where the title came from was my Grandmother's love of wild roses. So I know a little bit about her because of this book. The second most paternal line that goes back to colonial America is my, is my foster uh, lineage. It, they goes back to Reginald Foster, my great ninth great grandfather, and he arrived in Ipswich, Massachusetts in 1638. And this record shows that he was accompanied by five sons and two daughters. Again, this is a secondary source. I found it on archive.org. And, uh, and I was able to, to link up uh, this, this genealogy with genealogies that I've worked back, uh, backwards uh, to believe that this is the proper genealogy for, for, for my ancestry. I have kind of a problem with, with uh, this lineage, though I have a, I have a brick wall kind of in the middle uh, around my third and fourth great grandparents' fosters. And when I was researching the foster to try to make the connection, uh, I I first started in the Allen County Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, because they have an extensive genealogy survey, and I have a son that lives uh, nearby, so I went to their genealogy library to try to research my fosters, particularly the fosters that, that were subsequent to the ones in the, in the previous family history that I showed, they were able to use their, their, uh, their search and they were able to establish uh, through county histories that an Abraham Foster family arrived in 1836 from Pennsylvania. And that's where the other genealogy stopped. I, the genealogy uh, I showed previously stopped with with my fifth great grandfather in Pennsylvania, and it 
it did show that he had a son named Abraham. And this showed that Abraham migrated from Pennsylvania to uh, to uh, Illinois, LaSalle County, Illinois in 1836. The activity that was going on in Illinois at the time was interesting. It was just prior to the construction of the Illinois and Michigan Canal. The canal was constructed in the 1840s and it connected Lake Michigan uh, with the Mississippi River uh, via the Illinois River, via the Illinois River. And so I, I'm, I believe that probably they were recruited uh, as farmers to farm for produce that could be traded on the canal. Um, at least that's kind of the gist of the history of uh, LaSalle County, Illinois at that time. Uh, I've got a brick wall for these two generations of Abraham Fosters, my third and fourth great grandparents. Uh, they came from this history shows that they arrived in, in Illinois, but I, I haven't found uh, source information, primary source information to prove that. I found some sources. I found an 1850 census that shows an 80 year old Abraham Foster living with a daughter or a granddaughter. And that matches uh, the last Abraham Foster I knew in Pennsylvania because he was born he was born about uh, 1868 or 1870. So, uh, and then my second great grandfather, I found a marriage record uh, where he was married in 1848 in Illinois, and his wife died in childbirth in 1849. And uh, so, those are the only two, or the only three primary sources I found on on these three generations of Abraham Fosters. I'm not sure if uh, the third and fourth great grandfathers are even separate individuals. Family search doesn't help me because they show these ancestors, but they provide no sources. So will that leave me kind of stuck? So I have a hard time proving my lineage in the foster branch uh, through these uh, particular ancestors in Illinois. The uh, next uh, uh, paternal ancestor that goes back to colonial uh, uh, times or the Allen line, and Charles, uh, Charles Allen, my eighth great grandfather, uh, settled in Strawberry Bank, which is now Plymouth, New Hampshire, before 1657. They don't show his arrival, but they do show that he had property in New Hampshire in, in 1657. This book, uh, I received on the Allen family history, I received as a print copy with margin notes from the estate of my grandfather, Ernest Purnell, and I've also found it on archive.org, so it's available there also. So are there questions or comments on, on these three documents and the way I traced my, my ancestors from colonial times? Yeah, I wanted to uh, to point out to the class that archive.org is such a wonderful resource. And you also mentioned Project Gutenberg, which is also a, a wonderful resource. So I would encourage all of the students uh, to, you know, to go to those two websites and uh, look at the wonderful free resources that are available. However, what really caught my attention in this section of your presentation was the the idea of using a fiction book um, to add to your family history, and I thought that was so novel. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious, how did you happen to stumble across that book? Did you do a keyword search for your ancestor and it just came up? That's what I was searching for, uh, Driggs family, uh, or, or Driggs documents on archive.org, it, it uh, came up on that search. What a lucky find. I mean, just, that is wonderful. <laughs> Wow. And then later on, I did I did some more research on on Harold Driggs, who was the author of that book. He was he was an English professor in Ohio, and he and he wrote several other other books that were pretty interesting too. So uh, that gave me a link to start looking looking on the internet for information about Harold Driggs. And, 
and he's quite an interesting uncle that I have. Amazing. I mean, I just, wow, I, I never would have thought of fiction. It just never would have crossed my mind, but what a, what a great piece of advice. Um, now, you talked about uh, on your foster family line, the value of learning the local history of the area of, of where your ancestor lived. Uh, were you able ever to prove the connection between, you know, the growing um, for, of the food for the area and, and the canal? Were you ever, ever able to bring that all together in, in factual proof or, or just as a, uh, an assumption? It was it was really just an assumption. Uh, the history did describe the the promoters for the canal recruiting farmers to uh, grow produce. And, you know, prior to the construction of the canal, uh, they recruited farmers so that they would have produce to trade on the canal. That was in the history, and and the Fosters in Pennsylvania were farmers, and uh, and I did find documentation on one of the brothers, one of my great great uncles, uh, uh, was his name, Alfred Foster. I, I did find land records where he, where he, uh, where he had, uh, had uh, land from the government. Uh, I was not able to find any land records for the Abraham Fosters, however. So I, I, with, with, if they didn't own any land, I don't, can't prove that they farmed, but certainly one of the brothers owned land, and so he probably farmed. But that's that's one of the lines of research I was attempting to do to break the the brick wall was to look at the land records and, and I've not been able to find land records for the Abraham Fosters at all. So I really don't know what their occupation was. I don't have any uh, primary source information about that. Still, though, I, yeah, the point was well taken, and I I don't want to stress that to the class of always learning the local history of where your ancestor lived and it, you know, it can pay off in, in so many ways. So that looks like that's all the questions for this section. So I'll go ahead and turn off my microphone once again. Yeah, thank you. Next, I want to talk about Sophronia Allen uh, in my Allen ancestry. Uh, Sophronia was born in, in 1829, died in 1912. She was my second great grandmother. She was born in Burton, uh, New York. Her father was Andrew, and Andrew is is the the and he's my great grandfather who first joined the Mormon Church. And he joined the the LDS Church in 1833, uh, which was just a few years after the church was founded. I think the church was founded in about 1826 or 1827. Uh, the Mormon Church was still located in New York at the time. His family migrated with the Mormons uh, from New York to Ohio, on to Missouri and Illinois, and ultimately on into Utah. Uh, Sophronia Allen's, uh, of course, uh, followed her father, migrated with her father. Her brother and, and several of my other great uncles joined the Mormon Battalion in Illinois, the Mormon Battalion uh, was recruited during the uh, Mexican War in 1846, and uh, the Mormon Battalion marched from from Illinois to California, and uh, and were part of that uh, uh, Mexican American War in 1846. Uh, that information will become relevant a little bit later. Uh, family search showed. Uh, that she married Abraham Foster. Uh, that would be Abraham's at least his second marriage because his first wife died in childbirth in, in Illinois. Uh, there were sources of that uh, marriage in Family Search. Family Search showed that she was married in Salt Lake City, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and San Bernardino, California. It's kind of ob obvious that she couldn't be in all three of those places on the same day. So, so you know, that shows that uh, that uh, secondary sources can have conflicting information. Family search did show that she uh, finally lived in Redmond, Utah, which is where I knew where she lived. So I needed to find out which one of these were true. And ancestors and descendants. Uh, the family history of the Allen family showed 
that she was born in uh, or married in Salt Lake. She was married in San Bernardino, California. And also I went to visit the Family History Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, and found records that did confirm that she was married in San Bernardino, California. And so she and Abraham Foster uh, were connected in San Bernardino, California. And then they subsequently moved to Redmond, Utah. But it took a while for me to figure out what was going on with, with, uh, with the family search uh, information. This is, this is uh, based on the story of Jacob Rose compiled by Grant Mortensen. And Jacob Rose was uh, Sophronia Allen's first husband. And uh, he, was, he was a descendant of Jacob Rose and Sophronia Allen. I'm a descendant of Sophronia Allen and Abraham Foster. Uh, this shows uh, the migration of Sophronia from New York through Ohio and into Illinois, and ultimately on into uh, winter quarters in Iowa, which is where the Mormons, Mormons had a way station and, uh, and where they launched their, uh, their migration to Utah. Uh, she married uh, Jacob Rose in, in Iowa, and uh, he was a non-Mormon. They operated a ferry across the Missouri River uh, they were married in 1849, so so they did quite well ferrying uh, 49ers across the Missouri River from about 1849, and then they left in about 1852. So in 1852, uh, Brigham Young called all of the Mormons that were left back in Iowa in Illinois and Missouri to Utah, he, he closed uh, winter quarters and most of the uh, supporting supporting uh, places uh, along the trail and asked everybody to come on into, into Salt Lake City. So in 1852, Jacob Rose and Sophronia joined the wagon train that was going, going to Salt Lake City, but they didn't go to Salt Lake City. They went on to Washoe, which was then Utah. Now it's Nevada, but uh, but they went on to York County there in Washoe, and uh, and settled there. Probably, I'm speculating that probably that was a result of their experience with the 49ers at the ferry. But uh, Jacob Road didn't get involved in in the gold mining business. He was involved in building a canal from the Carson River to uh, Dalton and Gold Hill, and they settled in uh, in Franktown there in Washoe County. Uh, they uh, in uh, about 1855, uh, which is about three years after Sophronia and Jacob got to Washoe, the Mormon arrived and created a settlement there, uh, and. And they operated a sawmill, and Jacob Rose got involved in a dispute over the ownership of that, that sawmill. In 1857, Brigham Young recalled the uh, Mormon colony there in Utah back to Salt Lake to help defend against the uh, incursion by the Army to enforce polygamy laws in about 18, 1859. And they abandoned the sawmill, and Jacob Rose and another person took over the operation. Jacob Rose uh, paid for the sawmill with a yoke of oxen, and I guess his partner didn't pay anything. The Mormons uh, thought that they should get $10,000 for the sawmill, and, uh, and operators objected to that. And then later on, uh, the Mormons continued to press the dispute over the ownership, and at one point, Later on, in about 1860s, three or two, they claimed that now the, that uh, Jacob Rose and his partner owed the Mormons $20,000. And Jacob Rose and, and his partner decided that they really didn't know that money. And as a consequence, uh, Orson Hyde, who was a Mormon prophet, 
uh, read into the Utah legislature in open session is curse on the people of Carson and Washoe Valleys and on R.D. Siles and Jacob Rose specifically. Anyway, he issued this curse because they wouldn't settle the claim on the sawmill. I guess I would call this a historical uh, curiosity for the uh, for the uh, people of Washoe County in Nevada, but my family history it was a turning point. As a result of, well, I'm, and again I'm speculating, but but at that time, uh, Sophronia and, and Jacob separated. Uh, Sophronia took her daughter Nancy, uh, and uh, and she she uh, left uh, Jacob Rose. She went over the Sierras, uh, took a took a uh, paddle wheeler down the Sacramento River to San Francisco, and then a steamer to San Pedro, and went on to San Bernardino. And there, her brothers were operating ranches in a Mormon colony in San Bernardino. And recall that her brothers had joined the Mormon battalion. They were discharged from the Mormon battalion in, uh, in uh, 1847 and uh, became familiar with California. And ultimately, they set up a Mormon colony there in San Bernardino. So she joined her brothers in San Bernardino. And there she met and married, uh, or at least married, Abraham Foster. And, and they subsequently migrated to, uh, to Richmond, Utah. I have, I can't find any information or have been unable to find any information about how uh, Abraham Foster came from LaSalle County, Illinois to San Bernardino, California. The county history does say that after the death of his wife and childbirth, he left for Colorado. I've been looking uh, and so far been unsuccessful in finding any information on how, how he arrived in San Bernardino. Another document that I was able to find and found a, a, another source of information was the story of the Mormon colony in San Bernardino. It was sort of a way station. Uh, there were Mormons migrating to Salt Lake, not only along the Mormon Trail and later by railroad, but also coming by sea into San Francisco and San Pedro, California. The Mormons that were coming into uh, San Francisco were helped at a Mormon way station there by you in Washoe County in Genoa. And the ones that were coming in from San Pedro uh, would stop and be assisted at the way station in San Bernardino. From there, those, those folks would migrate on to Salt Lake City. Uh, I found this document in a, in a website called Early Journal Content, uh, Journal Storage, and it's a free uh, website. And so I thought I would include that as a source of information about stories about our ancestors also. Do you, uh, do you have any questions, uh, Suzanne, at this point? Or comments? Oh, not, at this, not, not at this point, but I did want to point out um, that your your illustrating uh, your illustration of Sophronia uh, Allen having multiple marriage dates uh, was a wonderful um, example of using the genealogical proof standard uh, to resolve discrepancies. So I just wanted to point that out to the class. Uh, and also, since you mentioned JSTOR on this particular slide. I wanted to also let the class know that we do have a link to JSTOR on the TMCC Library uh, database webpage. Uh, and all of our uh, community members, as well as our students and faculty members, have access to all of our subscription databases uh, that are available there on the link. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn off my microphone. Thank you. Now we'll go back to the Mayflower. Uh, this is my uh, my uh, lineage to uh, Stephen Hopkins. He's my 10th great grandfather. And this is the lineage that I've, I've proven to the satisfaction of the General Society of Mayflower descendants. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the story of Stephen Hopkins. 
on this 400th anniversary of the, of the Mayflower. Uh, I found uh, this book was recently published. This is a biography of Stephen Hopkins, A Stranger Among Saints, uh, the man who survived Jamestown and saved Plymouth. His story is a very interesting one. And uh, in uh, 1609, uh, Stephen Hopkins indentured himself uh, to the Virginia Company to the chaplain of the Jamestown colony. Uh, he, he sailed to, uh, to Jamestown on the Sea Venture. And the Sea Venture has quite a story. And that story is related uh, in a primary document in a, uh, in a book by uh, William Strachey called The True Reportery. William Strachey later on became a clerk in the Jamestown colony. And he wrote this, this story about the adventure of the Sea Venture. And it is a primary document. Uh, uh, William Shakespeare obtained a copy of the True Reportery, probably in about 1610 or 1609. And, uh, and, and, and he wrote the play The Tempest. And the Tempest, the idea for The Tempest came from this uh, document called The True Reportery about the story of the sea venture. So the Tempest uh, is a story of a shipwreck, and one of the characters in the Tempest is Stefano. And uh, I'm speculating that Stefano was inspired by uh, my 10th great-grandfather, Stephen Hopkins. Anyway, in 1609, the Sea Venture uh, sailed from, from England along with a fleet, uh, and, and uh, the, the fleet was to to provide support for the Jamestown colony. Jamestown colony was founded a couple of years earlier, but this was a support fleet. And uh, the flagship of the fleet was the Sea Venture. It had 150 passengers. It was caught in a hurricane and grounded on the coast of Bermuda. Uh, Stephen Hopkins was a passenger on, on that ship. So uh, the Passengers on the Sea Venture spent about 10 months on Bermuda, and while they were there, they salvaged uh, material from the wreck of the Sea Venture, and plus they they used cedar trees and, and other materials from, from the island of Bermuda, and they constructed two small uh, sailing vessels. And these two small sailing vessels uh, ultimately were able to take most of those people uh, on to Jamestown, which is about a 700-mile sail. Uh, to Jamestown. While they were building the ship, uh, Stephen Hopkins uh, had the idea that, that he would rather stay on Bermuda. Life was pretty good there. There were, there were fish in the bay, there were birds, and there were even hogs on the island that the Spanish had put their survival food. Uh, they had fruit in the forest, they had shelter, the climate was benign, and it was actually pretty pleasant. And uh, Stephen Hopkins uh, had the idea that, that he could stay there. And uh, when they told him that he couldn't because he was indentured uh, to go to Jamestown, his argument was that since they weren't at Jamestown, the indenture uh, wasn't effective. He was charged with mutiny, inciting mutiny, and was condemned to, to die. Uh, the passengers uh, pleaded for mercy and and his sentence was commuted, so he, he, he lived. And he was able to sail on one of these two small little boats on to Jamestown. In Jamestown, he completed his indenture. And about 1616, he returned to England. Uh, now, by virtue of that uh, indentured servitude, he was now a shareholder in the Virginia Company. And in 1620, he signed on with the with the Virginia Company to go with the with the uh, Mayflower Pilgrims uh, to uh, to the New World. So he was he was a passenger on the Mayflower. He was not a separatist. He was he was a merchant. He was there to to promote the commercial interest of the Virginia Company in the plantation. Uh, when he when they got to, to Plymouth, uh, Stephen Hopkins. Uh, 
knew the Algonquin language, so we knew the Indian languages, and he served, uh, according to this biography, he was instrumental in, uh, in coordinating or communicating between the Native Americans and the pilgrims. Uh, one of the interests, entrances of Mort's relation, uh, when they were negotiating that treaty that I showed earlier, said that that treaty was negotiated on the green carpet. And a green carpet was found in the estate of uh, Stephen Hopkins when he passed away. We had a very interesting life, and and uh, and I'm pretty proud to be a descendant of uh, Stephen Hopkins. This is a chart of the, math, uh, the mathematics of genealogy. In the first column, I show. I show starting with myself as one person, and then I show the number of grandparents in subsequent uh, uh, generations. If you get down to the tenth great, my tenth great grandparents, I have four thousand of them. This is the maximum. I have two lines of ancestry to uh, Stephen Hopkins, one through uh, one through one of his grandsons, and one through one of his granddaughters. And so Stephen Hopkins would count as two on this chart. The next column over shows the number of ancestors between me and, and that level. So between, you know, for instance, I have two parents and, and then I have two parents and, uh, and four grandparents for six. And if you go up to the 10th great grandparent level, I have over 8,000 ancestors to the 10th great uh, grandparent level. And what this illustrates to me is that is that each one of those ancestors has a story, and so there's just an inexhaustible opportunity to understand stories of our ancestors. I don't think I'll ever get up to 8,000 stories, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Any questions or comments at this point? Um, maybe you could just share for just a, a moment uh, a little bit more information about Relative Finder. You know, you talked about how that's how you, you kind of found your, your Mayflower ancestors. Uh, could you spend a moment talking about that? Okay, that, um, this is a chart from Relative Finder. It's, uh, it links to uh, familysearch.org, and so it can map, uh, map family trees uh, uh, from, uh, from family search onto a document like this that shows uh, lineage. In this case, you uh, you know I could put in Stephen Hopkins in the relative finder, and and it would search my family tree, and 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 find any any relatives uh, that I have related to Stephen Hopkins. It does not only direct ancestors but but also cousins and and so it does cousins and grandparents, and so you could you can map these. Uh, these relationships uh, in family search. Uh, they have several options where you can map uh, your relations. It, it will search for your relationship to celebrities. Uh, among them are Mayflower ancestors, American presidents, uh, astronauts, uh, scientists, uh, musicians. So you know it will it will find uh, relatives that you have that are musicians or in this case Mayflower ancestors. But if you know a person that you want to that you want to see if you're related to and you know their family search index number, which is this number, uh, can you see my mouth? Right there. There's an yes, index yes, number. Yes. And if you put a name or an index number of a person that you know that's that's in familysearch.org, it will try to create a a uh, and that's a tree for that particular person for you. That's a pretty nifty resource. So my students would need a family history, uh, family search account with with at least some sort of a tree in it uh, for it to be able to kind of match these all up. Yes, at least I believe so. Okay, great. Okay, and that's that's all the questions in the chat box so far. Okay. Well, here, here, here's a listing. At the end of my presentation, I put a listing of the sources that I used in my research. 
I think I mentioned most of them on as I went through. Uh, but, but this is a listing of, of the resources that I use. And hopefully that's useful to your students. And thank you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and I, I know the class really appreciates it. And uh, if they have any questions, may they reach out to you directly? Yes, they may. And my email address is, is on the title slide. Maybe you can go back to that first slide. Is that possible? Yeah. Wonderful. OK, well, uh, that, that would be all the questions that the class has up to this point. So I'm going to say thank you very much, Roger, for a fantastic uh, uh, presentation, one that I know my students learned a lot from. And uh, I will be in touch with you again soon. And, and once again, a, a wonderful uh, uh, thank you for, for just sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you.